Good morning, and uh, welcome to uh, this morning's scripture. Today we're reading from uh, the book of Isaiah, chapter 53. And before I read this passage, I, I just want to point out to you that these words are incredibly um, unique, and I would encourage you to listen to these words. And when you do, uh, recognize that Isaiah wrote these words 600 years before the time of Jesus. And so whenever I read this passage, it, it just assures me of God and the Holy Spirit's participation in Scripture. And you'll understand why when you listen to this. There's only one person that Isaiah can be talking about here. Please read along. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of God been revealed. He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground, he had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression, and judgment he was taken away, yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living, for the tr transgression of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked, and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth, Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and to cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and, will, and be satisfied by his knowledge. My righteous servant will will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors, for he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Welcome back, everybody, to Faith in Crisis, where we're discussing the perils of progressive Christianity. 
Uh, before we get into today's message, I just wanted to make a quick comment. Uh, over the past couple of weeks, uh, there have been a few people that have asked me if this current series is related to Pastor Andrew's departure and his theological positions. The answer is no. To be clear, I've never considered Andrew a progressive Christian. This series is one that I've wanted to do for some time. And I had people ask me about the topic of progressive Christianity, completely independent of what was taking place with Andrew. And it is a very hot topic right now, one that I believe to be urgent. Uh, I did discuss the optics of doing the series right away with the staff, but we decided to go ahead. Had we waited a month or two, I'm sure we would still have some people asking the same question. Uh, as we've said, anyone who has questions about our theological differences with Andrew, I am happy to discuss those with you in private. On a related note, other people have asked me about specific theologians and whether or not they are progressive Christians. Uh, the examples that we've been using in the series have tended to be people who have completely deconstructed. But the truth is that there are many theologians who would only embrace certain parts of progressive Christianity. I think you need to take each theologian into consideration individually. Just as an example, I love and respect Tim Keller. I've met him in his offices in Manhattan. I've read many of his books. I've been edified by his teaching. His book, The Prodigal God, is amazing. I even refer other people to his books. But I strongly disagree with him on his treatment of Genesis and do see his views as a form of deconstruction. I direct people away from his teaching in that area. His views on creation and the flood are not really consistent with historic Christianity. Uh, as I said in week two of the series, I think when people give away a natural reading of Genesis as narrative, they open the door to deconstructing in other areas. But I also want to say I respect Tim Keller, and some of his material will still be included in our Renew You material. He is certainly not a progressive Christian. So the bottom line is that these things are not always black and white. They exist more in a spectrum, and our goal is to discern the truth. But we should always be doing that as we strive to, you know, disagree respectfully when we need to do that. So today, we are in week four of our series. We're going to be talking about original sin and substitutionary atonement. And as I've been doing through this series, I'd like to introduce you to another uh, deconstructionist. Many of you are probably familiar with uh, the prominent evangelical leader, Tony Campolo. He's actually the former spiritual advisor to Bill Clinton, among other claims to fame. But fewer of you are probably familiar with his son, Bart Campolo. Uh, for years, Bart ran his father's ministry, but back in 2011, after a cycling accident, he came to terms with his growing lack of belief in God. In fact, in 2017, he and his father, Tony, co-authored the book, Why I Left, Why I Stayed, in which Tony explains why he maintains his Christian faith, and Bart, his son, explains why he has renounced his in favor of secular humanism. They've also released a fascinating film entitled, Far From the Tree, in fact, check out the trailer. Let me introduce you to my son, Bart Campolo. Hi, I'm Bart Campolo, and I want to thank you for being interested in the ministry of my father, Tony Campolo. You work with me in ministry. For years you worked with me, starting programs, ministries, mission organizations. You were a colleague. For most of my career, I was an evangelical Christian leader. And it got to the point where I was like, I don't believe any of it. From Bart Campolo to Tony Campolo. Dad, first of all, what you need to understand is that I'm not interested in making you look bad. The world has enough gotcha books. We need to write an I hear you. I see things differently. And I still love you book. Where nobody loses. I am a mystic. I, I feel the presence of God. I, I sense God leading me. The problem for me isn't that I'm angry at the church or that I'm resentful of you or anything like that. It's just, I can't believe that supernatural story anymore. I see. Working for years in the inner city and seeing the poverty and injustice there, Bart lost faith 
in God's sovereignty. In fact, look at what he, what he says. He says, it messed with my theology. I had a theology that said that God could intervene and do stuff. He said, I had to change my understanding of God's sovereignty had to get dialed down a bit. And so he admits this quite openly. Campolo admitted that changing his view of God's sovereignty was the beginning of the end of his faith. Why? Well, take a look. He says, because once you start adjusting your theology to match up to the reality you see in front of you, it's an infinite progression. So over the course of the next 30 years, my ability to believe in a supernatural narrative or a God who intervenes and does anything died a death of a thousand unanswered prayers. If you go to the next statement, he says, I passed through every stage of heresy. It starts out with sovereignty goes, then biblical authority goes, then I'm a universalist, now I'm marrying gay people. Pretty soon, I don't actually believe Jesus actually rose from the dead in a bodily way. And so, guys, Bart Campolo's deconstruction, you can see, is complete. And while he continues to work in the inner city, he has lost all faith in God, the Bible, and even the afterlife. And as we're going to see today, he has big issues with the concepts of original sin and substitutionary atonement as well. Well, let's start in on that today. I want to begin by talking about original sin. Original sin is the doctrine that human beings are born sinful, that our nature is corrupt even from conception. The doctrine teaches that sin was handed down to us through Adam. Uh, We use the word often imputed here, that Adam was representative of the entire human race since we were all in his seed when he sinned, and that his act of rebellion was imputed to all of us. This sin is imputed down through the bloodlines. A number of scriptures back up this doctrine, but it took a while before the entire church claimed it as an official doctrine. Basically, by late the late second century, Clement of Alexandria was writing about how it came from Adam, And from there, it really took off. It's surprising that it took as long as it did because it's a pretty clear teaching in Scripture. But some of these doctrines took some time. In Genesis chapter 3, we see Adam and Eve fall into sin and the immediate effects of the fall. In fact, the chapter goes on to record God's punishment for their wrongdoing, right? Pain and childbirth, the cursing of the ground and having to work by the sweat of their brow. Now, we know that these punishments are a reality for us as well. We experience them still today. So the fall impacted all of creation, including subsequent human beings. This is what we see from the Genesis record. Then in Psalm 51, this is a psalm of repentance uh, and contrition by King David after he committed adultery with Bathsheba and actually murdered her husband. As he is recognizing his own sinfulness, he also reveals truth about the condition of mankind. Look at what it says in Psalm chapter 51. David says, Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. And so guys, this is very insightful scripture here. David, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, states that his sinfulness began at his very conception in the womb. Jesus affirmed this sinful condition in many of his teachings as well. In fact, last week I quoted from Jesus how uh, what defiles us comes from inside of us, not from the outside. In other words, society doesn't make us sinful. Our environment isn't what makes us sinful. Our hearts are already sinful. Look at what John says in John chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. He says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, But to save the world through him, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already. So you see here, guys, our default position in entering the world is that of a sinner. We don't need to learn how to sin. We are born already in this corrupt state. Every parent knows this, right? We don't need to teach our children to lie or to steal. They do it very, very naturally. And God, in his holiness is not able to tolerate sin. It is diametrically opposed to his being and to his character. And so, as a result, God's wrath automatically comes against sin in all of its forms. Everywhere that sin is found, God's wrath comes against it. And this has serious implications for all of us who are born as human beings. You see, Adam's sin, we said, is imputed to us. We are born sinful. And so we are born, then, at odds with God and his holiness. We are literally, the New Testament teaches, his enemies. Jesus taught this. And we are under God's condemnation. Look at what it says in John chapter 3. 
Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. Now, we learned about the seriousness of God's wrath last week. But notice here, it's not that when we reject Jesus that we become condemned. No, it says here, when we reject Jesus, we simply continue in the state in which we were born, under the wrath of God. His wrath, it says, remains on us. So guys, we are completely incapable of saving ourselves. This is why the Bible says Jesus had to come to us to be our Savior. The Apostle Paul continues to build on the teaching of Jesus in this regard. He starts in Romans chapter 3 by affirming that all of mankind is literally sinful to the core. Look at what He says here, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. And he goes on in that passage to list just all of the ways that we are sinful to the core. He actually quotes from Psalm 14 and goes on uh, to paint a very bleak picture of mankind in that chapter, Romans chapter 3. Then in Romans chapter 5, he draws out a powerful parallel that Adam's sin is what dragged mankind into sin and death. But it's Christ's act of righteousness, his death on the cross, that pulled mankind out of sin and death. Look at what it says at the beginning of that passage in Romans 5. It says, therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned. Then a little further down, he says, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command. You see, even people that didn't actually break the law, they were already still under that condemnation, because it was in them. If the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? And so he gives this parallel. Adam pulled us into sin. Christ is the one that brings us out of sin. And he repeats this idea four different times here in this passage. Well, All of this is to show that the doctrine of original sin is very clear in Scripture. It's very clear. And I have to admit, um, if you've been raised to see humans as basically good, this might be a little bit shocking to you. In fact, it may challenge your paradigm for how you view humanity and even your faith in humanity itself. So this could be a very hard teaching for you to accept, but that doesn't change the fact, guys, that it is true. Well, as one might guess, when Bart Campolo stopped seeing God as sovereign and started doubting the Bible, he started doubting original sin as well. In fact, look at what he says here. He says, original sin is where the gospel starts, isn't it? We are all sinful by nature and therefore utterly incapable of redeeming ourselves and entirely deserving of eternal damnation. This may well be my biggest problem with evangelical Christianity, It is grounded in a a bizarre, counterintuitive self-hatred that claims that we uh, we have no intrinsic goodness or value of our own, but rather deserve to be eternally punished simply for being born human. Indeed, according to the good news, our only hope is the unmerited favor of God, which comes to us in the form of Jesus Christ, the sacrificial lamb who suffered and died in our place. So guys, Bart Campolo, once a Christian pastor, now finds this idea actually offensive. Let me give you a little fact here, guys, and this is, just, this is just true. Some realities are offensive. They are. And it takes humility to acknowledge that human beings are incapable of overcoming their own sin and in need of a Savior. Guys, that is a humility pill that every one of us needs to swallow. Campolo suggested that this is where the gospel starts, right, with this act of punishment, but that's actually not accurate. The gospel starts with the fact that God created mankind in his image, good, and in a beautiful relationship with God. Before original sin, there was the beautiful relationship with God, and that is still where God wants to take us. Don't forget that. That is actually where the gospel starts. Let's be honest, there's a painful reality to human history that we need to come to terms with here as we talk about original sin. We can blame everyone else for everything bad that's ever taken place in the world, but eventually we need to come to confess that we are all the problem. Can you agree with me on that? We are all the problem. 
And if we can humble ourselves just long enough to read what the Bible actually says, we will see that God has an amazing plan for fixing this sin problem. And that, guys, brings us to our second topic today, which is substitutionary atonement. This is God's solution. If you keep reading the Genesis account, you will see that immediately after Adam and Eve sinned, they felt shame. They sewed fig leaves together to hide their nakedness, and then they went and hid from God. But in his grace, it says in Genesis chapter 3, verse 22, the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. That's what it says in Genesis 3, 22. Now remember, up until this time, there was no death of any kind. And you have to read between the lines a little bit here in Genesis, but garments of skin means that God actually had to kill an animal to provide a covering for Adam and Eve's nakedness. This is what it means. In that moment, God actually instituted a practice that would continue on throughout history, a practice that we call substitutionary atonement. In the very next chapter of Genesis, we see the first children. They are Cain and Abel, and they are bringing offerings to God. Apparently, their parents taught them this. Cain brought the fruit of the vegetables from his garden, but Abel brought slaughtered animals from his flock. And if you read the story, you will know that God accepted Abel's offering but he rejected Cain's offering. Again, reading between the lines, it's pretty easy to see that God's accepted offering was the one that involved death and that involved blood. This is what we can see pretty clearly here. It seems evident that God showed Adam and Eve that the death of an animal provided covering for their sin for a time. Now, this idea was reinforced when the children of Israel left Egypt, and God required them to kill a lamb and to spread the blood on the doorposts of their house. This would provide protection from them as the death angel passed over. He would not visit them. He would pass over, which is where the name of that celebration comes from. Look at Exodus chapter 12. It says, On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. Again, guys, the blood of an animal is what covers them. This idea just further confirms, uh, is further confirmed rather when we get to the law. And this is exactly what God demanded from the children of Israel, blood sacrifices to atone for their sin. Again, look at Leviticus chapter 17. It says, For the life of a creature is in the blood, and I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. For centuries, guys, the children of Israel continued the tradition of making annual sacrifices of bulls and lambs and goats and even pigeons as a means of covering their sin for a season. This just became entrenched in their practice. In fact, Leviticus chapter 16, if you back up a chapter there, it describes a day of atonement in which the people sacrificed a goat to the Lord and then sent another goat away free into the desert as what we call a scapegoat. That's actually where that word comes from, the term that we use in our English language. It's an amazing picture of one goat's death providing freedom for the other one. Then when we get to the New Testament, guys, Jesus is the one who becomes the Lamb of God who sacrifices himself on the cross. His perfect blood now provides atonement, making it no longer necessary for people who accept his sacrifice to make these animal sacrifices. In John chapter 1, John the Baptist said, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him. He says, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then John the Apostle writes, this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. This is what the Lamb of God did. Now, the word for atoning sacrifice there is just one word in Greek. It's often translated as propitiation in some of our Bibles. Um, And the idea here, it's actually taken from the word in the Old Testament for the mercy seat in the Old Testament, that cover over the ark where the blood was applied to atone for mankind's sin. And so it's a very descriptive word here. I'm giving you a bit of a crash course, but you can see that this doctrine ties the Old and New Testaments together. It's literally what ties the two of them together. 
You can also see why the cross is the focal point of all of history and why it is extremely, extremely important and why we have to treat it with great care. For people who were born in sin under God's wrath, the cross is God's solution for paying the penalty for our sin. He died in our place. He suffered the wrath of God in our place. And to be precise, we call this the doctrine, not just of substitutionary atonement, but penal substitutionary atonement. That there was a penalty that God's justice required, and Jesus suffered that penalty in our place. So, as it relates to progressive Christianity, what's the problem? What's the issue here? Well, there's been a huge pushback on this long-held doctrine in recent years by progressive Christians. Now, it shouldn't be too, too surprising, knowing the distaste that they already have demonstrated for the idea of wrath, and we talked about that last week. If you didn't take that in, go and check it out online. But progressive Christians can be quite offended by the idea that Christ was killed by his father. Some have gone as far as to call him a cosmic child abuser under this kind of a scenario. So you can see there's a big chasm here within Christianity of the perspective on this and these two views, one seeing it as being the most precious and essential act of God in history and the other seeing it as, you know, the greatest act of cruelty and frankly, unnecessary in their opinion. Opponents of penal substitutionary atonement will make statements that this doctrine, it didn't even exist until the Reformation in the 16th century with Luther and Calvin. Well, Calvin certainly did refine and develop the idea, but He by no means came up with the idea. First of all, it's very clear in Scripture, and we will take a look at some of those Scriptures in just a second. But secondly, many of the church fathers spoke of the exact concept in their own words, and not just a couple. Athanasius, Justin Martyr, uh, Eusebius, Ambrose, Augustine, Gregory the Great, and many more talked about this doctrine in their own words. There are a number of different views regarding the atonement, which is not surprising. It is a very rich doctrine. Let me kind of summarize just a few of these for you. Ransom theory is basically that Christ's death was to pay a ransom to Satan for our souls, like he had taken us ransom. Now, this is just faulty logic, even though it was somewhat popular in the early days uh, of the church, but it makes it sound like Satan is more powerful than God, and it really uh, doesn't work logically. We have Anselm's satisfaction theory that Christ's death restored honor back to God, that sin had taken away. But the problem here is that this theory really doesn't deal with mankind's sin. Like, what's dealing with the sin problem? More recently, uh, a lot of people have latched onto the idea of Christus Victor, Christ as the victorious one, that Christ's death was the announcement of victory over the power of sin and death, which absolutely it was. I don't know any Christian who would argue with that. But is that all it was? That's the question here. Then there's the exemplary theory that Christ's death set the supreme example of godliness for us to follow. Yes, hard to argue. It did, but what about payment for sin? Again, we have to come back to that question. And then there's the moral influence uh, theory that Christ's death was for the purpose of showing us God's love. But what about the penalty for sin? And if it was just to show us God's love, surely there had to be a less violent way of doing that, wouldn't there? Well, there are elements of truth in many of these atonement theories, but at the heart of the doctrine of atonement is this idea that a penalty needed to be paid for the injustice of our sin, to satisfy the justice and even the wrath of God against injustice. In his classic theology, Wayne Grudem calls it, look at this, he calls penal substitutionary atonement the orthodox understanding of the atonement held by evangelical theologians. And it has been the prominent view for centuries, guys, among, you know, Christian people. But it came under attack shortly after the time of the writing of the book, The Shack, in case you were wondering, by William Paul Young. Both in the book and afterward, afterward, Young went on the attack, saying that, Any God who would sacrifice his son is just a primitive child abuser. Now, that's a very faulty view that misunderstands the Trinity completely. See, the Father and Jesus are both God. Jesus is not God's son in the way that a human son belongs to a human father. Furthermore, Scripture affirms that Jesus went to the cross willingly. He wasn't forced by anyone. He was no one's whipping boy, as some people say. 
But recently, as progressives have lost the taste for God's wrath, this faulty view has gained more and more traction. And the sad truth is that many pastors are letting go of the core doctrine of penal substitutionary atonement. One local pastor who has openly come against this doctrine, who I am not labeling as a progressive Christian, let me be clear, but it is Bruxy Cavey at the Meeting House. He says that supporters of penal substitutionary atonement, including John Calvin, are obsessed with this idea of what God does with his wrath. Uh, In fact, take a look at what he says here about that. He says, when we look at the cross, we look at a cross with almost a confused view. Is the cross a picture of God loving us through Jesus? Or is it a picture of God wrathing against Jesus? And then we call that love. I would say that latter view goes beyond Scripture. And so, Bruxy says this very clearly in one of his podcasts. But does it really say more than Scripture says? I've spent some time checking into Bruxy's views on this subject, and I wanted to understand how he cannot see the penal aspect of Christ's death on the cross. It's pretty clear to me and to many theologians going all the way back to the Apostle Paul, and very strongly with Luther and Calvin, even if some of these people prior to Calvin didn't use the specific term. In one podcast, Bruxy says that the best defense supporters of penal substitutionary atonement have is Isaiah chapter 53, verse 10. Well, let's take a look. It says, Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. While Bruxy's right, this is a great verse, and in truth, he can't effectively explain it away. But he tries to make it sound in his podcast like this is the only verse that we have to stand on, saying you would think that it would be said more often and more clearly, but it's simply not there, Bruxy says. Well, I have to disagree. We've already discussed that the Old Testament sacrificial system thoroughly showed the idea of penal substitutionary atonement, the Passover lamb, and Jesus as the lamb of God. Everything about the sacrificial lamb was about the lamb taking the punishment for the sinner. But I also had us read Isaiah 53 today because I wanted you to see just how full that chapter is on the penal aspect of Christ's death, not just verse 10, as Bruxy says. In verse 4, it says that we considered him punished by God for his own sins, is the inference. There's no question that God punished him, and he actually clarifies that further down in the passage. But look at what else Isaiah says here, guys, in this passage. He says he was pierced for our transgressions. That's clearly substitutionary atonement. If God's doing it, then it's penal right? He was crushed for our iniquities. Again, substitutionary atonement is in view. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. Guys, there's no way around this. This is penal, right? Punishment is the word being used. By his wounds, we are healed, it says in verse 5. Then you get down to verse 7, and it describes this suffering servant, Christ, who was to come, as the lamb who was taken away to be slaughtered right? Because sin requires death. Remember this, guys. In the Old Testament, the priest took the lamb and then slaughtered it on behalf of the sinner. God is pictured here as the priest who kills the lamb for the people. It's a very, very clear image. In verse 8, it says, by oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Again, judgment, guys, is punishment. This is penal substitutionary atonement. For the transgression of my people, Isaiah says, he was punished. That's penal. Verse 10, again, very clearly, it was the Lord's will to crush him and to cause him to suffer. God sacrificed his son, guys, as an offering, and that's what it says at the end. The Lord makes his life an offering for sin. The Lord makes his life an offering for sin. Guys, the entire chapter of Isaiah 53 is about the fact that that the suffering servant, Christ, was punished by God to atone for our sin. And that aligns perfectly with the Old Testament sacrificial system and also with what the New Testament teaches about atonement. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, it says that Christ actually became sin for us. He became sin for us. You see, sin is what God punishes. And as Christ became sin for us, the punishment of God came down on him. And this is the very heart of the gospel, guys. This is why we take this so seriously. I want to be very clear. 
that the rejection of penal substitutionary atonement is not driven by Scripture. It is driven by the distaste for God's wrath, very clearly. In fact, Bart Campolo says this. Look at what he says. Why can't our gracious God simply forgive us the same way Jesus taught his disciples to forgive one another? How could slaughtering an innocent make the guilty party any more fit for divine fellowship? Parental discipline, I can easily accept, but not the re uh, re uh, retributive violence of the cross. To me, that's what's really immoral. Well, let's look at what some other progressive Christians are saying. Rob Bell says, God didn't set up the sacrificial system. People did. The sacrificial system evolved as humans developed rituals and rites to help them deal with their guilt and fear. That is just completely not scriptural. God didn't need to kill someone to be happy with humanity. What kind of a God would do that? Or, or what kind of a God would that be? Awful, horrific, Bell says. Well, another man who's considered progressive, Brian Zand says, Calvary is not where we see how violent God is. Calvary is where we see how violent our civilization is. The only thing God will call justice is setting the world right, not punishing an innocent substitute for the petty sake of appeasement. Well, guys, I think right there, we can kind of see clearly the whole problem. Uh, Zand and so many progressives see the concept of God's judgment, you see the word right there, as being petty. And they do it because they downplay the significance of God's holiness. That's why we talked about that last week and went into it in detail. It's so important that people not lose sight of God's holiness. Progressives can't understand that God can be love and justice at the same time. That in the same beautiful act, God not only loved and forgave mankind, but also satisfied justice in a real and necessary way. You have to be able to see both together. Well, Calvin understood that God's justice required the punishment to take place somewhere. And he was right. Sin has to be punished. That's consistent with everything Scripture teaches. Remember, God, guys, God's love is not greater than his holiness or his justice. Progressives will try to tell you that God's love is greater than all. No, his holiness and justice are just as great. Progressives will say things like, isn't the point of forgiveness that we just let something go? Isn't that what Jesus and the apostles taught? Just let it go. Why does there have to be punishment? Yes, guys, we forgive, but we can do that knowing that we are leaving room for God's justice. That's why we're able to do it. As it says in Romans chapter 12, verse 19, leave room for God's wrath because he will avenge, it says. That's the reason why we can forgive, because we know somewhere, somehow, God is going to even the scales of justice. When progressives talk about God just letting go of justice, it shows that they really haven't studied the character of God. Well, at Renew Church, we studied the character of God in a series we did called God Has a Name. And in Exodus chapter 34, we saw what God says about himself and his own character. Look at what he said. In Exodus chapter 34, it says, He passed in front of Moses proclaiming the Lord, or Yahweh, 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 the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wicked, wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. And guys, that is such a fundamental part of God's character, something he was trying to reveal to Moses. Progressives think, think, think that God should just offer forgiveness without having to vent his wrath. But they overlook obvious verses like Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. It says, in fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So they're overlooking this verse entirely. Forgiveness requires the shedding of blood. Justice has to be paid somewhere. And for God to be able to forgive you, that penalty has to be paid somewhere. Let me wrap it up just by talking about Elisa Childers once again. When Elisa was still meeting with her progressive pastor, he taught her that the Israelites were only imitating the pagans in Mesopotamia by practicing blood sacrifice. He taught her that they only thought that they needed to bring bulls and goats to God in sacrifice. And Elisa was confused. She went away thinking, well, if the sacrificial system wasn't something that God set up, then was Moses wrong? And if, if you're saying that, then did Jesus die for nothing? 
It's a great question. Guys, some people will try to convince you that this isn't a big deal. This is a very big deal. If Jesus didn't suffer the wrath of God for people's sin, then is God just going to overlook the injustices that have taken place here on earth? Is that the kind of God that you want? And if Jesus' death was just a moral example for us, then who is paying the penalty for your sins? Moral examples are great, but who's paying the penalty for your sins? Guys, the good news is that even though we were born the enemies of God, original sin, Jesus took the punishment of our sin, the punishment that it deserved, on the cross, on himself. And as he hung on the cross there, dying, he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God's justice came down on him so that it didn't have to come down on you and me. Guys, if you need guidance on how to accept Jesus' sacrifice as your own, please talk to us. That is literally why we exist as a church. We want you to understand the love that God has for you, the penalty that he paid for you on the cross, so that you can receive forgiveness of your sins. Email me this week. Talk to us this week. Next week, guys, we're going to talk about the divinity of Jesus, the virgin birth, and the resurrection. It just gets more and more intense as we go along. But I want to give you a little assignment this week. I'm going to ask that you watch a movie. Easy assignment, right? I want you to watch a movie called American Gospel. There's a few of these, so look for the right one. It's the one called Christ Crucified. It's a long movie. It's over two hours in length, so settle in. Get some popcorn. You're going to have to get it on like Apple TV Plus or iTunes, but you, you'll have to pay for it. Um, but do watch this. Maybe you'll want to do it as, as your Renew group. Maybe you can do it over two or three weeks. Or just do it on your own personally. But watch this. It's all about progressive Christianity. You're going to see a number of the faces that we've shown you here. And a lot of the same voices you will be listening to. But it's excellent, excellent viewing that will really clarify this topic for you. And I encourage you to do that this week.